Dr. Eric Roselli. He is the Chief of Adult Cardiac Surgery and the Surgical Co-Director of Center for Aortic Disease uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic. He is an expert in all forms of aortic diseases. And as I alluded to in my talk, some of the things he does, they are incredible. Uh, he's pushing the envelope like no mama's business. Uh, <laughs> He's written about 150 papers, book chapters, et cetera, in all things aorta. Uh, you know, he's basically, we are, we are essentially like brothers except for one day. That's a Saturday after Thanksgiving. That's when Ohio State plays Michigan. <laughs> That's about the only day, uh, you know? But anyway, it is my pleasure and honor. He's done a lot for the Marfan Foundation, including the Cleveland Walk. And you, in fact, he was the top fundraiser for the 2017 event. So it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Eric. He'll be talking about the psychosocial elements. No, he'll be talking about <laughs> surgery. Thanks. Thanks for the kind introduction, Melinda. And thank you, everyone, for uh, spending a Saturday with us here. Um, my, uh, my, I've, I've got three kids and uh, my little boy Mateo is eight years old and he always says to me, um, you know, when I talk a minute, like, Dad, what are, you, what are you doing tomorrow? Are you fixing somebody or are you talking? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I chatted with him before he came here. He's got a basketball game. And uh, I said, Dad, Dad, are you fixing somebody or are you talking today when you go to work? And I says, I'm talking. He goes, that's okay, Dad. That's really good and, and important too. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so thank you guys, everyone, for being here, and thank you to all my colleagues for taking time on the on the weekend to be here. And um, you know, because the the things that we we all think about um, as clinicians every single day, and and uh, I know sometimes it seems um, like we're we're a little sick because we even dream about the stuff that we do sometimes. Um, but uh, it requires a whole team to work together uh, across all spectrums of not only the various disciplines that we work in from the medical side, but I mean the team of the caregivers and the patients and their families too. So thank you all for being here. I love that we've got, you know, the kids in the room down the hall and all, and all that. And um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about surgery and endovascular treatment of patients, and, and I changed my slide to patients with connective tissue disorders, although I know this is a Marfan uh, a Society and a Marfan event, but um, I also know that there's people with other associated disorders included here, and I think the more we come together as a group to, to manage all of these things and as our understanding improves, uh, we'll understand that every single person is sort of unique in, in the way that they're affected by these various connective tissue disorders. And the more we learn about it, we'll learn about the commonalities that we have and so that we can become better at treating all these things. So that's enough of my sort of social discussion about the social <laughs> stuff. Uh, I do list uh, a list uh, of disclosures. I work with several of the companies that manufacture devices in the surgeries that we do, and that provides uh, an opportunity for us to interact with engineers and teams in research and development to develop better ways to treat these diseases. They uh, not only, uh, we not only help, help them to give them insight in how to make better tools for us to treat these uh, often mechanical complications of disease, uh, but they also help to provide us with uh, funding uh, to promote research. And so I think it's important to include these things when we talk. And a lot of the stuff that I do is off-label and some of it's investigational. So aneurysm and dissection is increasing in prevalence worldwide. Uh, I think that most of that's because we've become better at appreciating how important this disease is in human beings, and we become much better at diagnosing it sooner. If you look at uh, these sort of trends, they're not only going up in uh, in the Swedish population where they keep track of everybody because they have uh, socialized medicine, uh, but it's true across the board. And the operations that we're performing in patients is also going up, and that's because we're better at it and we better understand uh, how to do it safer and how to deliver this care. 
Here in Cleveland, we're the largest aortic center, uh, certainly in North America and potentially in the world. We do over 1,200 aortic operations a year, and it represents at least uh, one-fifth to one-quarter of the cardiovascular operations we do in our department. We know that aortic disease can be fatal. This is an intraoperative photograph of a root aneurysm. You see that purple thing on the left is the atrium, and the uh, aorta is clearly dilated down at the base. And this is an aortic dissection. You, you can see that thing looks like somebody's been, uh, you know, using it as a punching bag. It's coming apart. Uh, but amazingly, when these, even when these aortas are in these acute phases where they start to come apart, they often hold together long enough for us to do something to fix them. And this is some, you know, this is a cartoon just demonstrating what some of these operations look like. Um, on, the, on the far right, you see just, uh, just an ascending aorta replacement with a tube graft in the middle. That's a patient with an ascending replacement and a valve replacement. And on the left is somebody that's had a total root replacement where the coronaries have been reimplanted, the valve's been replaced, and the ascending's replaced. It's often called a modified Bentall procedure. These are really simplistic cartoons, but it just gives you a sense of sort of what some of these operations look like. But as you all know, the aorta is about six times longer than this little segment of the aorta and the, and the proximal aorta. Uh, and so we fix one segment at a time as we need to. This is an intraoperative photo of what one of these ascending aortic grafts look like. I know some people say, yeah, I got this mesh thing in my, in my, it's not a mesh. We didn't wrap anything. That didn't work. You know, they used to do that in the 50s. They wrapped cellophane around aorta as they fell apart. No, we cut that bad aorta out and we completely replace it with a new hose. You know, it looks kind of like a little baby fire hose in there. The nice thing is, is that this material is polyester. It's going to be around for hundreds of years. So, you know, the, in the future, they'll be talking about, you know, the barbaric humans from the 21st century and what we did to people. And these graphs will still be sitting in the ground. So the segment you get replaced, you can count on. It's the bits of tissue that we sew to on either end that we have to keep track of. Okay, we know those things are degenerating before that, you know, you get to the operating room and we know that um, we can monitor it and we can fix them in segments. So we trust the graft material. We can do these operations safely in this study that we published recently in, in 2016. We looked at a bunch of patients who underwent elective repair of the ascending aorta. This wasn't just connective tissue disease patients, but, but a broad spectrum of patients. Uh, there were several thousand patients in this series. And the risk of death was less than 1% in people who had just the isolated uh, aortic operations and 2% uh, in people who had multiple component operations. A large proportion of these were redo operations, patients with coronary artery disease, multivalve disease, uh, and other complex problems. When it comes to the aortic root, which is that sort of first part of the aorta, we've also published on this. This is a series. Uh, where Lars Svensson was the lead author. We looked at sort of four different options for replacing the aortic root. Uh, on the left is a mechanical valve with a root replacement. The second one is uh, the same kind of operation with a biologic valve that's a pig or a cow valve. The next one's a homograft. I don't have a pretty cartoon for that, but that's basically a human aortic transplant, also a biologic option. And on the right is that valve preserving root. So when we looked at nearly 1,000 of these patients kind of evenly distributed and look at our outcomes, when we do elective surgery, again, risk of death is less than 1% and the stroke risk is also low. More and more we're doing these valve preserving operations. In 2016, we did 87. That's by far the largest number. It's often referred to as a David's operation. Dr. David, great guy, Cleveland Clinic alumnus actually, uh, probably does about, you know, 15 or 20 a year. This year we're on par to do over 100. So we have great experience, and it's not just me and Lars doing these, although we do a lot of them. We've got a whole team of cardioaortic surgeon specialists who can do these complex operations really, really well. And by the way, you don't have to fall in love with me to send me your records. <laughs> we're happy to help anybody. Um, the valve sparing root replacement, 
what it does is allow us to maintain the physiology of the aortic root, which is really a complex structure. You know, unlike a, a man-made valve, which just sort of moves in one sort of plane and opens and closes, these, these God-made or you know, natural valves uh, are very complex in their structure. There's a complex three-dimensional structure to this. Uh, the valve and the aortic root are really kind of all part of one in the same big complex structure. And so there's a lot of things that happens when the heart beats. Although the valve opens passively, that is the function of the heart is what opens it, uh, it its proper function relies on it being in that aortic structure in the right kind of orientation, in the right kind of position, and in a stable structure. And so this operation, what we do is we replace all that aorta that we don't like, that's no good, that's degenerated. And if the valve looks even pretty good, we can put it into a happy home so that it continue to function well for many, many years because it's still alive. And often the leaflets of the valve, kind of the, the substrate that we're working with, still looks pretty healthy and we do our best to save that. And so there's just a couple of cartoons that describe this operation a little bit. So when we do this, what we do is we cut out all of that aorta. We save the, the leaflets of the valve. You can see the two coronary arteries are those uh, little red things with kind of a button on the end of them that we've, we've just disassembled everything. And we put stitches onto the inside of the heart, right inside the ventricle. We put these stitches into the muscle and then we put them through this graft and we slide the graft down onto the heart. And then we sew that valve back inside of the root. Uh, the um, Svensson modification to this is basically um, based on some of the sizing and the stabilization that we do so uh, we can make a consistent repair that matches the patient's uh, body size a bit. But when we're done, it looks something like this when it's sitting inside that new graft, a really beautiful, healthy-looking valve that's now in a, this reliable space suspended in three dimensions, like kind of suspended like a, like a suspension bridge so that the valve can function properly. And when it's sitting in this nice anatomic orientation, the stress and strain upon those leaflets is reduced. Your valve opens 100,000 times a day. I mean, we're just sitting here taking all these wonderful things for granted sometimes. I know you guys don't take anything for granted, but but, uh, but it's pretty amazing that these valves can survive through, you know, millions of cycles over a lifetime. And even sometimes when we see someone with a dilated root and the valve is working okay, when we get in the operating room, you can see that it's been working really hard to work okay. Like this valve, I think you can appreciate kind of on the bottom of the screen, it looks like it's hanging by a bowstring. That poor valve was still functioning fairly well in this patient when we took him to take care of this aneurysm, uh, but, but that valve had been really stretched out and parts of it had degenerated. However, most of the valves still look really healthy, and so even in people who have a root aneurysm with a leaking valve or some element of dysfunction, we can still save. So I put this valve back together and we just reconstructed that area, what we call the commissure, where it was all stretched out because we do these operations you know, every couple of days and we're really experienced with it. And so if you're gonna have this kind of operation and you have the luxury to have it electively, which I would recommend, you know, if you're kind of heading down that pathway that you're gonna need it, um, it's worthwhile to do it uh, uh, electively so you get the best chance of salvaging the, opera uh, the valve and getting a safe operation. Now, um, you know, sometimes the argument is, well, let's put it off a little bit because we're going to have to replace the valve. Well, if we can repair the valve, and we're pretty confident we can repair the valve and save the valve, I think it sort of changes the urgency and sort of the, some of that decision-making process. And that's the kind of conversation you have to have with your cardiologist and with your surgeon. And we're happy to see you early on in the process when you have a diagnosis or you're wondering about sort of timing of things. We make these decisions as a team, patient, patient's family, cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, anybody else who wants to throw in their two cents, I'm willing to hear about it because we have to learn for, from, from everybody and tailor everybody's care to their situation. What we know is that survival is from improving for patients with Marfan syndrome. Used to be the average was 45 years back in this, this study published in 1972. Uh, we've gotten a lot better. We're seeing more and more patients living beyond their 70s. 
and I think uh, that uh, as we get better in managing those life-threatening mechanical complications in a safer way, and we have a lifelong approach to sort of managing these, these issues, uh, will not only help people to live longer, but I think we can improve the quality of life as well. We know that um, when we looked at this David reimplantation kind of operation in patients with, with connective tissue disorders, in this study that was published a few years back, uh, we had no, no mortalities in that series of almost 200 patients. Uh, one stroke, although it wasn't a, a permanently disabling one, no infections in those patients. And you can see in this analysis, out to eight years, the, uh, the um, survival uh, was, was excellent. And, uh, and the durability of these valves was also maintained with a freedom of reoperation at nine, uh, better 90% uh, at 10 years and 93% at five years. However, we know that even when you've had the elective operation to spare your valve, to relate, place your root, to take care of that aneurysm, we haven't cured you of your problem. Remember that the disease process that's occurring inside of every person with, with, uh, with a connective tissue disorder, whatever, whatever sort of flavor it may be, whether it's Marfan's, Lowe's, Dees, Ehlers-Danlos, or something we haven't developed a name for yet because we don't understand the specific details of it, that it is a degenerative process happening in the walls of the aorta. It's a biochemical process that's occurring before the aneurysm develops, before the dissection occurs. And so this is unpublished data. But we've uh, seen uh, many patients who have had their elective root and ascending repair who've come back later on with a new dissection in their downstream aorta. It's okay. The good thing is, is that if we've, you know, protected that first part of the aorta between the heart and the brain, that you survive that dissection. But then you're left with that sort of degenerative or dissected area of the downstream aorta that also may need management. We saw that most of those patients do need something done. Acute aortic syndrome, aortic dissection, is the problem we try to avoid, but we're also working really hard to treat better and understand better, and I think we've got many options, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens when you've had a dissection. You can see the picture on the left is what a tear looks like in someone's ascending aorta when that dissection happens. You can tell just looking at it, it's pretty ugly. Uh, the one on the right is a patient who has hematoma. Most of the time, patients with um, uh, Marfan syndrome or some of the, the the syndromic connective tissue disorders don't present with intramural hematoma, um, but you may have a tear in the distal aorta that runs forward that looks like hematoma in the front of the aorta where there's this fresh clot in the walls. Either way, it needs to be treated because if we don't, the aorta can rupture, you can bleed around your heart, and it can compress your heart, you can develop severe leaking of the valve that can cause heart failure, it can cut off blood flow to branches. We want to avoid all that stuff. We classify it by sort of the extent of where the tear occurs, but this just helps to guide us in some way to sort of talk uh, uh, intelligibly about what we're seeing. We know that high volume centers do a better job with getting patients through these operations when the emergency occurs. Interestingly, this Medicare data described a high volume center as one that does more than five of these operations in a year. The Cleveland, yeah, right? Cleveland Clinic is um, like that. We're, if this slide was continued, we'd be out in the lobby over there. We do, uh, we do about 70 or 80 of these emergencies a year and about seven or 800 a year. But there's many other centers that do a lot of these operations. And, and there's a better appreciation of developing referral networks to get folks to busier centers and centralize this care, and we'll continue to do that. We know that endovascular therapy has redefined the way we take care of dissections in the descending aorta. We can put a stent in quickly and easily when someone's having a, a serious problem related to that dissection and re-deliver re blood flow to threatened organs right away, like the case we did last night where a lady had no blood flow from about her belly button down. When she came in, she was blue. And this morning, she's pink. She still needs another operation on her aorta up here, but our team works together and we have an understanding of how to use all these tools to help folks. And I know people are told, oh, the stents don't work in people with connective tissue disorders. Well, they don't work necessarily as a permanent fix, but none of the things we do work as a permanent fix until all your blood vessels, all your aorta is replaced. So let's embrace this technology and use it and understand its limitations. That, that's kind of the way I think about it. We know that 
with the advent of these endovascular therapies that our open outcomes have improved for taking care of patients with type B dissections. It's because we have more tools in our box. We've developed what we call the uh, B safer or branch single anastomosis frozen elephant trunk repair when patients come to us with a type A dissection. We fix the first part of the aorta with a surgical graft the same way it's done pretty much everywhere and has been done for the last 30 years. But we also put a stent graft into the aorta around the arch and into the, some of the branch vessels so we can kind of get some more of that aorta to heal, that really vulnerable aorta in the arch and the descending aorta while we're there. And it doesn't add any risk. This is a technique that I've developed over the last several years and we're developing new devices to allow other centers to do this complex operation more easily. And in some folks where we don't have good open surgical options, we've even put some of these stent grafts into the ascending aorta because some of the groundbreaking work we've done here using off-label uh, devices in these really difficult situations. We've got uh, partners in industry and the FDA to now uh, put some funds into developing these devices for these endovascular solutions for the ascending aorta. We're starting a trial in January with one of these novel devices which is made specifically for the ascending aorta to take that curved shape, understanding the, the details of that anatomy and allowing us to provide these new therapies. So the treatment paradigm for a type A dissection used to be, you know, surgery or hospice. It was just two sort of ways to go. Now there's several other bars. We've got several options. We've got these hybrid techniques where we combine stent grafts with open surgery, that frozen elephant trunk that you may have heard about. And we've got these ascending stent grafts. The numbers on this slide are old. They're all much higher now. Uh, but as our options get better, so do these sort of decision-making trees. I'm not going to go through every aspect of this, but when we see someone with a type B dissection, we also have many more options, combining open and endovascular therapies and tailoring it to the patient. And now we're doing these stent graft therapies sooner in people that develop a dissection because maybe we can get that aorta to heal faster that makes later operations easier to deal with. We do the, all of this as a team. We've got imaging specialists. We've got cardiologists in the intensive care unit. We've got cardiologists in the outpatient clinic, cardioaortic surgeons, which means vascular and cardiac surgery working together. We've got radiology techs that manages, manage the machines with us and understand the little details about how to image people better. And it all centers around the patient and getting that patient the treatment as fast as possible. With that kind of approach, our outcomes for type A dissection look way better than what you see at even large published centers. It's consistently less than 10% mortality when people come in with these emergencies at the Cleveland Clinic. That little red bar are the really elderly folks that come in with these emergencies that shouldn't get anything done for the most part. But even long-term outcomes aren't great. This is Medicare data that shows that three-year survival is only around 60% for people after a dissection. Our outcomes are, are better here and some other um, single center data is better. But I think the point is made that not only do we need to focus on getting people through the emergency, we need to focus on how do we manage them in the chronic setting. Because when you survive that emergency, you're still left with a whole bunch of aorta that has been damaged in the process or that Hill still has the disease process that led to that dissection in the first place. So we got to think about it long term. If you're left with a dissection, you're at higher risk for having other surgeries or having other complications. We know this. It's been shown over and over again. No longer is it you fly in on a helicopter, you have some emergency surgery, we wheel you off and don't see you again and all you remember is a little helicopter ride, okay? Now we provide better follow-up, lifelong follow-up. And sometimes these syndromes happen in even people that have normal-sized aorta. This data from the International Registry of Dissection showed that 60% of people had dissections less than five and a half centimeters. They weren't all people with known connective tissue disorders. There's a whole bunch that about these connective tissue problems or what's happening in the aorta that we need to understand better. And so it's important to get family members screened and imaged and you know I think there's a much greater appreciation for that than there ever has been. Because these are these processes that are happening underneath everything. The, the unseen processes that are, are happening 
are related to not just the degenerative biochemical process, but that stress that's happening in relation to it. You know, you may all have the same sort of, you know, genetic defect that's been identified by some blood that's been drawn, but each one of you is different, and each one of you has a body and an aorta that's been exposed to different mechanical stress, and your body will, will respond differently, just like each one of us is unique. But we need to monitor that and understand it better. And we're doing that in our lab. Uh, you know, not only do we uh, operate, but we realize we have an opportunity when we're cutting tissue out of patients, that instead of throwing it away, we can study it and learn from it. And so we're working together as a group to do this, not only as in multiple disciplines within our center, uh, but also across the spectrum of people that are focused on treating this disease. Our good friends are from all the other important centers that you know and you've read about are treating these diseases. We share the work that we're doing and we share our practices that we use in the basic science labs to, a to answer questions. In our lab, we're answering questions not just about what happens in the cells of the wall of the aorta, but we've been answering questions about what happens, what's happening in that space between the cells. And that's a novel area of interest that we've been really uh, uncovering some really interesting findings. We've identified some proteins in the wall of the aorta just in this last year that no one knew was there. Why is that important? Well, it might provide some new understanding about the mechanisms of how this happens. It may provide us with a biomarker that we can measure in the bloodstream or we can measure otherwise. And we've got really uh, outstanding researchers working with us uh, to help with that. You can see the difference between a normal and an abnormal aorta is pretty apparent in this image. And so this revolution of knowledge will improve our understanding of the genetic basis and the pathophysiology that comes from it and will direct new therapies and new diagnostic techniques because we know that thoracic aortic disease is very commonly familial, not only with the known sort of syndromes that we, that we see or some of the other genetically triggered associations I've listed here, but we also know that only 20% of clearly familial aneurysms and dissections have known genetic variants. There's got to be a whole bunch more that we don't know about yet. And that's why Dr. Crawford, who is the guy who really was one of the first guys to fix thoracoabdominal aneurysms, a surgeon who taught us that we can do these things. Dr. Svensson's mentor taught us that no patient should be considered cured of the disease. We looked at patients who've had root surgery or have had connective tissue uh, disease and had surgery on their downstream aortas beyond the root. We studied these patients and we saw we were able to do these operations safely with a mortality of less than 3%. These are really complex operations but a lot of these patients needed further interventions. Over half of the patients needed more operations on their downstream aorta, even after we fixed the arch or the upper descending aorta. And you can see on this curve that by 10 years, a large proportion of the patients, 60%, needed additional reinterventions. Most of these patients had a dissection. Once you have a dissection, the dye may be cast that you're gonna need more surgery, so monitor it closely and get with a surgeon who can help in that decision-making process. The conventional repair is to replace the aorta with this big graft like you see on the bottom, and we can do that really safely. Uh, but, as I mentioned earlier, we're embracing these endovascular techniques, but the endovascular techniques provide incomplete repair. Even in someone where we have what looks like a very good indication for endovascular therapy, the aorta heals in around that device only about two-thirds of the time, so it needs to be monitored. The real advantage is I can do it percutaneously with a puncture in the groin. The disadvantage is we might not be done. We might have to come back, and that's okay. We can combine these therapies. We can combine endovascular and open therapies. Sometimes I'll modify the aorta to make a better place for a stent to hold on to. Sometimes we'll modify the stent graft with branches in it to fit into branch vessels so it can be customized to a patient's anatomy. Sometimes we'll put other devices side by side to block flow that's coming up and around a stent graft into the false lumen. We have experience with all of these. And sometimes we'll say, you know what, that stent graft took care of the descending aorta, but that thoracoabdominal aorta needs an open operation now. I'm gonna sew to that stent graft and keep it because it's worked great, but that doesn't burn any bridges. We can use all of these therapies in combination. And so this is the decision-making tree we have in a chronic dissection. It looks crazy. But these are why we need to kind of get the whole team involved early on. Here's some cases. This is a 
24-year-old who had a root aneurysm with Marfan. You can see the CAT scan on the left. He had a stent graft because he came in and really needed something done right away because the dissection was causing malperfusion. And then we fixed the rest of that aorta on the right with an open operation. After the stent graft part healed, we sewed everything in. That whole aorta has been replaced in that patient. And now he's essentially cured of his aortic disease. This is a woman with Lowy's Dietz. When she was 44, she had acute dissection, had the root replaced. She was left with this dissection downstream. Four years later, we did a redo arch replacement. And I modified the descending aorta to create a landing zone for a stent graft. Even though the abdominal aorta is dissected, it's not enlarged. And so we were able to put a stent graft in to fix the rest of that aorta right down to that area where we created a good spot for the stent graft to sit. And we're just watching this abdominal aorta, and we've been watching it for years. It's working fine. Here's a patient with Marfan syndrome also, had an acute type B dissection treated medically when she was 47. Many years later, we put a stent graft in. We balloon that stent graft. We put some devices alongside it to prevent blood flow from going back up along that dissection. Same thing. We're just watching that abdominal aorta because it's not enlarged. This is a guy, actually, he's one of twins. They both had dissections of their ascending aorta within hours of each other. I operated on these guys the same night and the next morning. We put stent grafts in their descending aorta. Our neurosurgeons put devices into their cranium because they had intracranial aneurysms. And then we did open thoracal abdominal aneurysm repairs. I've done the same kind of thing on both of these guys over a period of a few years. This is a 42-year-old with Lois Dietz syndrome. He had his root and his ascending and arch replaced somewhere else several years ago and was doing okay, but he's had some you know, regular follow-up of his downstream aorta. He came to us six years after that root was replaced, had new back pain, was found to have uh, some growth of the upper part of his aorta. He really didn't want to have an open operation. He didn't want to take time off of work. I said, all right, well, let's put a stent graft in and see if that upper aorta will heal. I'm open to that as long as you come back and you know that this is going to be a partial fix. We did that. The T-bar worked great. The aorta healed in through the descending aorta. Then a couple years later, the abdominal aorta grew. So what did we do? We took him back to the operating room. We replaced that abdominal aorta. It's a big operation, but he handled it just fine. And now his aorta looks like this. The whole aorta has been replaced from inside his left ventricle all the way down to his pelvis. It was staged. By staging it, we protect his brain. By staging it, we protect his spinal cord. By staging it, we allowed him to work for a couple more years so we could pay for the darn thing. This is a 58-year-old who knew he had Marfan's, had a motorcycle. Uh, well, it wasn't really an accident. He was on his motorcycle, and he had the event occur, and he pulled over on the side of the road, thank God, and he called 911 and said, I've got Marfan's, and something isn't right. So he had this uh, uh, emergency uh, surgery of his, of his uh, root and his ascending aorta. Uh, that was replaced with a, with a pig valve, and he had a hemi arch. He recovered just fine, didn't have a stroke, even though the dissection went into his carotid arteries. We knew he had this persistent dissection uh, in his arch and uh, in his head vessels. We were monitoring this. He had rapid growth, and um, it grew like six or seven millimeters in just four months. And so we put a stent graft in this thing, and we popped the stent graft open to try and promote healing of this aorta. You can see there's a balloon going up in that thing. We bypassed the artery to his left arm. This looked pretty good, but he still had some flow in the false lumen coming from the tear in his carotid artery. Although we had a really good seal downstream, you can see the a little bit of flow alongside the stent, that bright area uh, on the right. And so we brought him back. And just by a puncture in his groin, I put a wire up into his carotid artery and put this little covered stent. It's a stent with some Gore-Tex covering on it to cover the tear in his carotid artery. Self-expanding stent. Went home, I don't know, if not the next day, then maybe two days later. We also uh, ballooned this stent that we had put in after it had healed a little bit from the previous operation to try and promote some sealing inside there, and you see how the stent popped open when I ballooned it. That just sort of pushed it against the wall. 
And now we got this CAT scan. There's a stent in his carotid artery up on the left. It's no longer dissected. It's healed really nicely. All of his arch is healed in. In fact, this whole thoracic aorta looks pretty normal, except there's a little bit of metal in there. But just like that polyester, that metal's partly titanium. It's going to last a really long time. His downstream aorta, we will monitor, and we have been monitoring. And so we're thinking that with this new technology, maybe we provide earlier endovascular repair for parts of the aorta that have been damaged. We can get it to heal better, may improve your quality of life and maybe put off some uh, eventual surgery later down the road or maybe avoid it completely. And we're understanding these processes a lot better. We use a multidisciplinary team to provide this lifelong care to patients and families. And you know, once you've had a dissection or surgery or even if you're getting close to it, we're here as a surgeon to work as part of that team in the decision-making process. You know, I, I heard Dr. Desai talk about you know, cracking someone's chest and saying, Melinda, what did you send me? That doesn't happen here. We look at those images well. We learn from these guys how to read the images. We make that decision-making process, uh, that decision -making process together. Uh, we all use that imaging and all these other tools at our disposal to be as good as possible. And working in such, our outpatient volume has, improved, has increased. We're, we're providing more resources to see people and help you with these decision-making processes. And so even though aortic disease can be fatal, it doesn't have to be. We can replace the whole aorta in people. We provide long, long, long life, lifelong, comprehensive care for advanced thoracic aortic disease. We know that more and more survivors will need late treatment, especially after dissection. But people can do better with earlier proactive mechanical treatments to these solutions. We know that the endovascular therapies can be safe and expand treatment options, although we have to understand the limitations of those things. The open and TVAR treatment options are complementary to one another. We do need better devices. We're working on developing them. We need a better understanding of the late natural history of this disease. We're working on that as well. And we will achieve longer lifespans. We will improve the quality of life. And we will improve our understanding of this disease working together. Thank you so much for your attention.